Welcome to this video on world population. This video is part of a video series on our successful future in which I would like to ask and answer certain questions concerning well, our human development into a sustainable future. The questions I want to answer in this video are why is population, world population such an important parameter and on the other hand side what is known about the development of the world population. Well, let's first focus on the first question. Why is world population, global population, such an important parameter? In order to evaluate that, let's have a look at this diagram where I collected some information. On the one hand side, we have the world population. Everybody needs to fulfill certain demands with respect to energy, materials, as well as foodstuff. And these things are supplied from fossil resources on the one hand side and land area. Basis is per capita roughly 7,000 square meters per capita. Per capita means per person. So I take the overall agricultural land area in this case and divide that by global population. And then I get the average value on a global scale per capita per person. For fossil resources, we are using 5.6 kilograms per person and day. So almost six kilograms, which is quite a lot. Produce on global average 21,000 kilowatt hours per capita and year from that. Materials is roughly one kilogram per capita and day. This includes building materials, textiles, so our clothing, uh, everything more or less what we use materially, all the plastics of course as well. And finally food, 2.8 kilograms of primary production per capita and day. And of course the world population is currently around 7.6 billion people. Okay, what we want to do now actually in the near future, in the next few decades, is to get rid of the fossil resources and replace that more or less by land area. So we want to produce energy as well as materials solely from the land area, solar energy, wind energy, for example. Of course, not necessarily only agricultural area, but also deserts, for example. Nevertheless, it shows that there's a significant shift this almost six kilograms per capita and day, we have to somehow substitute by land area productivities. And we realize actually, if you look at this scheme, that the single major driver is actually this value, the world population, because world population times the per capita demands of energy, materials, and food are, uh, are the overall consumptions that we have, the overall demands, requirements that we have, and of course it scales also the waste that we produce, including the CO2 which we are emitting, emitting into the atmosphere, which then leads to the climate change. And that is actually why world population is such an important parameter. It drives everything. If this is reduced, then the overall consumptions are less, the overall waste production is less. Now the question is, what do we know about world population? How it has been developing in the past and how it will be developing into the future. In order to get some first idea, I would like to show this diagram. It's taken from the United Nations World Population Prospects and here I'm using the 2017 revision. It's updated every two years, so the Statistics Department of the United Nations re-evaluates their data roughly every two years and uh, publishes the data on the one hand side historical data, so this is up to here where we are today, and then they have a very detailed estimation on how country-wise the population growth uh, will develop into the future, and from that they derive the medium variant, and then based on that also the high variant and the low variant are published. Most researchers actually use this medium variant for their projections into the future. Now I have been realizing that these data have been shifting over the past and I collect all the references that I have been using for the following slides I'm uh, collecting on this slide. In principle, the actual value, the 2017 vision, revision, or whenever you are looking at this video, possibly also later revisions, and also some of the earlier revisions are available on this website of this DESA population division of the United Nations. And, uh, well, if you collect all the data from the different years, well, what can we learn from that? As I said, I had observed that the medium variant has been slightly shifting over the years, so from publication to publication. And now what I want to show is actually that I 
focus on the values for 2050. So I'm taking only the values for the year 2050, plot these values, but plot them associated to, to the date when they were published. And this is actually shown here. So these are all data for the year 2050, the projection for 2050, but associated to the publication date between 1996 and 2017. And we see for the medium and the low variant a systematic well, trend in the data. They have always been preferentially shifted a little bit up in upward direction. So there is a significant upward slope in these last data. And now I'm an engineer. I would like to see how where that will be going. So I plot straight lines through that trend. And if I do that, I wind up with this and I fitted actually the slope as well as this uh, common point here to this data, this square minimization. Why is this a common point? Well, that's, that it is simply such, if all this is relating to 2050, if you would then predict in 2050 the world population for that year, that is of course just an estimate of that value of pe number of people that we have at that point in time. So if you publish here, it's just one number that we estimate. There may be a slight variation, but let's forget about that. So that's more or less one value. And we see actually that there's a significant upward trend and this value especially is of interest. It's around 11 billion people. Now we can look where that is so to speak related to. If we plot this value in this diagram that I shown before, then we see that the 11 billion people is slightly above the high variant. Okay, so we see actually that Taking into account the continual upward shift of the projections of the United Nations will lead to a value somewhere around 11 billion people here, which is even ab above the high variant. Now the question is how that relates to those probabilities and uncertainties that are estimated by the United Nations. So in the recent revision, they also published a probabilistic uh, scenario, so to speak, and they mentioned certain values of probabilities that certain popul world population values will occur. And this is indicated by the black dots in this diagram. So this is the probability versus the world population. I fitted the Gaussian curve through that. And uh, of course, I include also the medium variant. Um, it's all for 2050, for the population 2050, the low variant and the high variant. And one sees that actually the uncertainties estimated by the Nations, that's a very small possible shift that they uh, estimate from these uncertainties around their medium variant. The high and the low, low variant, actually the probabilities are essentially zero. And even for this 11 billion people, the probability is zero as well. Now, how does that fit together? What do, can we learn from that? Yeah, we see this are the uncertainties, but nevertheless, if we do such a meta study, so a study of studies, if we plot their development over time, we wind up more or less with this value. How can that be understood? Well, one has to distinguish in such projections two possible errors that can occur. On the one hand side, one can talk about uncertainty which means I possibly don't know exactly the values of population in one country. It's only, we say, plus minus 5% or so. Also, how many children a woman will get in her lifetime has a certain uncertainty, this certain so-called fertility. So there are known possible errors, and I can at least estimate uh, some quantitative value of the size or the magnitude of that uncertainty. But if I want to talk about the future, there's another aspect which is quite important, which is the so-called ignorance. It's simply the lack of knowledge. I can't tell the future. Why can't I tell it? Well, because individual events may shift the future or the development of the future completely. If Donald Trump is elected president or not, makes a difference. And that, of course, is on global scale to a certain degree. So that lack of knowledge, how future will develop, leads, of course, to an inaccuracy of all the projections as well. Of course, that lack of knowledge decreases over time. And the bad thing about that is actually this effect cannot be quantified. I cannot say, well, if a certain president is in some country or some policies change due to whatever individual event, I cannot quantify the outcome of that. And if one thinks a little bit about it, there are many options what can shift significantly if you go into a uh, new future. The future is open to development, as one usually says. 
So uncertainty can be quantified and that's presumably what has been quantified by the United Nations. So that leads to their probability and the meta study gives us possibly some idea about this ignorance that occurs. And what is this lack of knowledge that we actually have? So what changed in the past uh, that led to this shift? And there are three main things that can be mentioned. On the one hand side, and I had an ex email exchange with the people from the statistics department. One thing is that there's a slower than expected fertility decline in many sub-Saharan African countries. So they had some estimate how that should go and apparently that didn't work out. It was always a little bit higher, the fertility, the number of children per woman in her lifetime. That's usually how fertility is expressed. Then improved child survival worldwide. And finally, a slowdown or reversal of the HIV epidemic and also uh, the better access to corresponding treatment so that those people who are infected can get children and reproduce. And then, of course, global population will increase due to that a little bit more than you would expect if you assume that that doesn't occur. So it shows that indeed our knowledge is increasing continually and that of course leads always to some adjustments. In the case I have shown it's always an adjustment in upward direction in the last years at least. This is this very significant trend. And now how can we understand that or why is that actually so? We can understand that a little bit from this plot where the total fertility in children per woman, again global average, as a function of time is uh, shown. These are the historical data and this is the projections of the medium variant. Actually one has to say since not all women died at the moment you can't or it's, you, you cannot, so to speak, express what, how many children a woman will have in her lifetime from the current women who are there because they still can have children. So you don't know exactly these last values. There is a certain uncertainty with respect to that as well. And now you see that there's a significant curvature and the question is now how will that continue? Yeah, will the slope continue as it is assumed here for the medium variant or will the curvature continue and level off at, at some value up here, say 2.5 or so where we are roughly at the moment? You can't say. And it's very delicate shifts that are possible here still for the future so to speak and you know, don't know how that will work out. This diagram also allows to tell a little bit what should be the goal if you want to have a sustainable population. Sustainable population means that every parents, every couple, so to speak, reproduces, so two people having two children. And of course, if you have more than two children, then these parents are responsible for a 50, if there's a third child, there's a 50% increase of resource consumption. They are responsible for, for their children and their offspring, the offspring of their children, so more or less into the infinite future. So roughly two is the value, two children per woman or per couple, is uh, the sustainable value actually a little bit higher because unfortunately some children die before they can reproduce themselves so it can be 2.1 2.2 something of this order of magnitude but today we are significantly above that somewhere around 2.5 so this is not sustainable yet Having discussed these aspects, we can, so to speak now, say that what we expect where we will be winding up in the future. Uh, and we have seen that the medium variant is that which is most probable, taking the uncertainties into account, accounting also for the ignorance, the meta study trend, so to speak. We see that we may be winding up here for the high variant. So we would expect that the development works out somewhere in that range. That is not, so this value is of course not more certain or has a higher probability than that. It could very well be that even the low variant will turn out to be realized. But we, from those things that we see at the moment, so if we assume that the past trends will continue into the future, we know with uncertainty we are here, with the meta study and the ignorance we are somewhere over here, so we would expect actually if past trends continue in the future that we will be winding up somewhere in this range. So between the medium and the high variant that is what we ex be expected. Now having discussed all the da these data we can also have a look um, again at the first question that I asked 
that was why is world population so important because now we have the data available and I would like to show some data and point out some few data to see how, why that is so important. If we look for example how between 1990 and today the world population increased we see that that is an increase if you evaluate that it's roughly of the order of 2.3 billion people. So since 2000, 1990 the uh, world population increased by 2.5 billion people. On the other hand side we can look at how many undernourished people we have in million here as a function of time and there again as compared to 1990 today we have of the order of 200 million people less undernourished. Which means on the whole we have been additionally 2.5 more billion people fed, so the 2.3 of population growth, the 0.2, the 200 million that are more under or that are less undernourished than we had were in 1990. Of course we have to subtract from that the population increase so we see that the overall undernourishment decreased only by 0.2 billion that is 200 million people. So actually we feed 2.5 billion people more as compared to 1990 but because of the population growth undernourishment decreased only that little. And that shows actually that the increase in population has eaten up literally more or less our capabilities of uh, feeding more people. And that's actually why we can directly see that population growth is so detrimental for human development. Of course just taking these numbers and doing the simple balances may be a little bit too simplistic because economics and trade and things like that are important as well of course and they are influenced of course by population growth, economic development etc. So it's not necessarily as simple as shown here but nevertheless we see that we are feeding actually 2.5 billion people more today than 1990 which is a dramatic, a gigantic shift actually. And the decrease in undernourishment is minor as compared to that and that's of course not positive. Now the question is of course how can we influence population growth and for that one has to realize one important relation and that is shown here. It's the fertility again in children per woman now as a function of GDP for different countries per capita and that is expressed in US dollars per capita and year. And we see also GDP is the gross domestic product which characterizes the economic power of that country so to speak. How much income has been generated relates to that. So we have China of course, we have India and as we said two would be a nice value because then we are sustainable slightly above possibly. China is of course below because of the long uh, period of one child policy. India is slightly above but on a good track so to speak. But we see that for example Nigeria, Pakistan, Iraq, Angola, Democratic Republic of the Congo are, re Congo are relatively high, especially Nigeria. And at that point I should also say, I mean it's obvious more or less possibly, that the size of the circle uh, is characterizing the overall population of the country. So if we have here a population growth, uh, fertility of more than five, almost six for Nigeria, that means that within one generation well, the population will of the order of triple because two, uh, two parents will have almost six children which is two people producing an offspring of six, additional six people since in 25 years the population in these countries is relatively young, won't die. That means that there are the two parents plus the threefold uh, children which means the population will at least triple if not quadruple within one generation of the order of 25 years. And that means that this, this bubble here will be increasing in size quite significantly in the near future. That's one thing. On the other hand side we see that actually the more GDP we have, the better off the people are, the lower the number of children actually is. And that means of course that for developed countries there has to be a fundamental goal to develop these less developed countries in order to reduce their population growth, their fertility on a very quite natural way. It's simple, there's no force or anything behind that. It simply occurs if you're apparently a little bit wealthier or living in a wealthier environment then you produce less children. Yeah. 
and we should we would need to uh, use that effect so to speak to get the population growth down especially for the large bubbles here with the high values of fertility because only then we will be able for example to cope with hunger with world hunger with undernourishment now after after having said all these things let's collect the points the we saw that the United Nations high population variant is equally realistic as the medium variant. There's no reason why either one should be less probable. Which means that in 2050 we will have between 9.7 and 11 billion people and in 2100 between 11.2 and 16.5 billion people. And we, th we see the uncertainty between this, or of these values, it's a factor of 1.5 roughly. So there's an uncertainty of 50%, which is gigantic. Yeah. That will have a strong effect on resource consumption and waste production, and it will also have a strong effect on world hunger, how we develop. And that, of course, means that we should try to reduce population growth as quickly as possible to reach sustainability, also with respect to world population. With that, I would like to say thank you for this video and I hope to see you again in one of the next videos of this series.